jag måste ta bort massa bilder då så att de får ju skicka jag publicerar ju eller jag har ju mitt mejladress där. Om de får mejla mig så fan. Det är bra att man tecknar och så jobba lite. So, uh, just so everyone gets seated and have your coffee or water prepared for this next seminar. Okay, uh, my name is uh, Terry Karlsson. I'm the chairman of uh, the Association of Investigative Journalism in Sweden. Uh, I work for Swedish National Television and uh, we're about to listen to a colleague of mine at Swedish National Television, the editor-in-chief for the most uh, prestigious uh, TV program for investigative journalism in Sweden. It's called Uppdrag Granskning, Mission to Investigate. Uh, the speaker has been the editor-in-chief for more than 10 years for this program, and he has had a huge impact for investigative journalism in Sweden, also as a key member for a long time of our association. I can promise you that this is uh, a presentation that will inspire a lot of people. Uh, I've seen it many times and every time I realize that his uh, mythology and his take on investigative journalism is worth listening to over and over again. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Nils Hansson. Thank you. Thank you for those very kind words. Um, yeah, this will be about uh, the basics of investigative uh, journalism, the ABC of investigative journalism. And you can see here uh, two heroes of investigative journalism, two celebrated heroes, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, who revealed the Watergate scandal in the early 70s. Um, at this conference, uh, we can learn about a lot of tools these guys couldn't use. We have learned a lot about data tools. And, uh, but when I'm thinking back on our best stories, the stories we have made, which have meant a difference to our society, that have made great impact on our society, my conclusion is that we use their tools very, very much. In fact, in almost every story we make, a story that makes impact, we use the same tools as they did. You can call it old school, but it works. And I, when I say we, as Faye said, it's this program, Mission Investigate, in Swedish, we is Uppdrag uh, Granskning, which is very difficult to say for Swede, also but more difficult for many of you. And um, we have been around um, well, yeah, for uh, 15, 15 years, and we do 45 programs a year, one hour a week, prime time. We are 35 members of the staff. We're based in Gothenburg on the Swedish west coast, not in the capital, Stockholm. And we try to get a Swedish angle on all stories, but we, we, we work a lot internationally when we do cross-border uh, investigations, which uh, uh, Sven Bergman and Joachim Dimmack uh, told you about in a presentation yesterday. Um, to do investigative reporting is a very demanding uh, challenge. It's like you are expected to move mountains in every, every project. And I think of poor uh, King Sisyphus, who had to roll up the stone up on the hill, and then the stone 
roll down again, and then he had to roll it up again forever. Poor Sisyphus. And sometimes, as an investigative reporter, you feel like Sisyphus. Poor me. Um, this is an analysis of the mood of an investigative reporter during an investigative project. Um, and as you see, it goes up and down. Um, when you have got a, a, a go decision from your boss, uh, life is wonderful. You're talking to a lot of interesting people. You get a huge amount of documents. It is so easy to get documents nowadays. You sleep very, very good. But sooner or later, sooner or later, you will find yourself in the black tunnel. And that is when deadline is coming nearer and the crucial, the key document is still missing. You don't have the evidence you need. And suddenly, your victim drops out. And the whistleblower just has disappeared. The whistleblower who have you, you met a couple of times and who was so promising just disappeared. At this moment, in this black tunnel, you don't sleep good at night. You wake up three in the morning and ask yourself, why did I become an investigative reporter? Why did I become a journalist anyhow? Why didn't I choose another job? Insurance man or something like that. No. Uh, and this is something that you have to experience and you have to try to master this black tunnel. And at this moment, you need a real good editor telling you it's not so bad. Think about it. You have that and that. We have the minimum of a story. You have quite a good story. Maybe not as good as we want it, but still a good story. Maybe you should try another track. You have to bite in the bullet and do the best you can out of this situation. And if you do that, you will see the light again. And hopefully, at the end, you have a success story but you have to handle this black tunnel. And it's worth it. This is a picture from uh, the latest uh, uh, global conference that was in Rio in, in Brazil, and we won the Daniel Pearl Award, the Global Investigative Journalist Award, uh, well, except USA. We were pointed out as the best, uh, we, we have made the best investigative story and that was the Teleacom company, Tila Sunira's uh, corruption deal with Uzbekistan uh, dictator's daughter, Gunara Karimova. And it's worth it, because you make a difference, difference as a journalist. You can improve conditions for people. You can get not only award, but you can also get appreciation at, in your newsroom, uh, hopefully also a higher salary. And it's so, so many positive ingredients in being in an investigative journalist. But the most important thing all, of course, is that you live up to the expectations you can have of a journalist to make your best to improve the society, to change the world for better. We don't say that loud, but I say it now. We want to change the world to the better. Um, we are at this program, Mission Investigate, we have demanding goals from our bosses in the capital of Stock, Stock, Stockholm. They want us to make great impact on society at least twice every season. What I mean by that, I really don't know, but <laughs> if you make a difference, then I think you know about it. You, you realize, now we make a difference. Um, and we are supposed to get 10% of the population watching the program at least twice every season. And sometimes we succeed, sometimes not. And we are expected to win two international awards, which we didn't uh, make last year, but in 2013 we won three international awards. Um, but this year, so far, no international awards, but we have a couple of months left. And I will not be sacked, I think if we don't live up to that, but I don't know. Um, we will now discuss th three, four, four important steps to reach those goals. 
uh, goals that we are, uh, have to handle, and we have to find a method to reach up to these goals. The idea, you know, this brilliant idea. We have to examine our own ideas. But first of all, how do you get that brilliant idea? And the answer is, I don't know. I don't know. If I knew, I would be the best editor in this world. But I have some tips to give. When you read the program of this conference, you might think that investigative journalism is only about corruption and corruption and corruption. And that's, that's very important, of course. But there's so much else you can do investigations on. You can investigate internet hate. Uh, we have done uh, several programs about hate, grooming, and so on, on internet. I'll give you one example from uh, five years ago, a program that still is discussed in Sweden. Um, it's about uh, a rape case. A 14-year-old girl was raped by a 16-year-old boy. Uh, we got the tip that this boy is innocent. It's a question. It's a case of wrongly convicted. We went to this small community called Bjästa in the northern part of Sweden to find out about this. And soon the reporters realized it's not a case of wrongly convicted. It's a case of, of, a, case, it's a, case of a young girl who made this allegation against a boy and got him convicted in court. She is the one who is blamed for doing this. In fact, she had to leave this town because she was, people was turning their back on her. They uh, uh, put um, hate comments on her on internet, Facebook, and so on. At the same time, uh, the rapist was praised because everybody thought he was innocent. Despite this uh, verdict, it was upside down where the victim had to flee and the offender could stay in the community and being prized. Very strange. And now we'll see. Uh, and I can say that I was not really sure that this story should be told in our program when I was in the discussion, uh, uh, in the newsroom discussion about this program, because it's very sensitive issues about um, sexual crime and youngsters and so on. And, uh, but we made the story, and I will show you a short clip um, which reveals something really extraordinary. And um, we uh, try, tried our best to unidentify those youngsters. We, we called the girl Linnea, she had another name, and we called uh, the rapist Oscar. And at this moment, our, our reporter is making an interview with a priest in this small community to get his reaction. Because now we know, we have known that this young boy, Oscar, is accused of another rape. Another rape. Linnea tvingas byta skola och flyttar 50 mil hemifrån för att börja om. Filmen från skolas slutningen hade kunnat vara slutet på en historia där offret måste fly och gärningsmannen hyllas. Men det är inte slutet. Bara några timmar senare, på kvällen, firar Oscar skolavslutningen med sina kompisar på en liten badstrand. Med på festen är den 17-åriga flickan Jennifer. Vet du vad som hände senare på kvällen efter den här skolavslutningen? Ingenting. Det vet du inte. Då våldtog han ytterligare en ung flicka. 
Jag har hört rykten om att det hade hänt någonting efteråt, men mera vet jag inte. Hur ser du på det? Ja, då går luften ur den när, när man hör sånt. Vad tänker du? Jag tänker stackars kille. Alltså, så... Och tjejen givetvis också. Uh, I'm afraid the subtitles didn't work here really, but what he said at the end was, poor boy. And then he said, yeah, and the girl, of course, also. That was his reaction. Um, yeah, it's quite unbelievable. Uh, well, this was a story about hate on the internet. It was a story about uh, 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 sexual... Um, Uh, about rape, where the victim is the one who is blamed. We're talking about two universal uh, phenomena. We're talking about a pattern that is all over the world. And this local story became global. This local story won an award in uh, Germany, pre-Europa, and also in uh, USA at IRE, Investigative Reporters and Editors. So this is an investigative story, not about corruption, but about something else that is very important to tell our viewers, our public, about. And in fact now, this story has become a movie, which also has received rewards in Germany and in the States. And it's heavily discussed in Sweden because that the family of this rape girl, Linnea, they feel misrepre misrepresented in this movie, They feel that they are under very negative light in this movie. So it's a lot of discussion at this moment about this movie in Sweden. This shows that an investigative piece of journalism can get great impact, can make a great impact. We can make a difference. Okay. At my news, we, we receive around 10,000 to 15,000 tips a year. We can almost not handle it. But if you don't have any tips, or if you, like we do, uh, discuss what is the most important thing for us to show to our viewers, that's a natural question to ask. What is really important? So sometimes we have a discussion, which problem is the biggest? Or which problem is the most upsetting for our viewers? That's a good question to ask. And then you think about it, and then you get this brilliant idea. What can be more important than healthcare? You go to the boss and say, hey boss, I would like to make an investigation on healthcare. And then the boss says, what a brilliant idea. You are a genius. No, of course not. The boss doesn't say that you have to go one step further. This is a no-no. What you have is an important, an important uh, topic or issue, but now you have to try to find the story. You can sell into the, the editor. In doing that, we can talk about system failures. You get into the system and talk to people working inside and ask them, If you were a journalist, like I am, where would you dig? It's no interview. You just talk about people inside the system. It's not controversial. It's not that sensitive. You can talk about insiders, with insiders about this. And then you get something important. You get a, an idea with an edge. People are dying needlessly, because of bad hygiene at the hospital. That's what one doctor is saying, one nurse is saying, they're saying the same thing. That's the biggest problem at this moment. We don't have clean hands, as we should have at this hospital. Now you can go to your boss and say, I have a brilliant idea, boss. And the boss will agree. That's a brilliant idea. How to reveal corruption, if you don't have any ideas or tips? 
uh, first of all, you have to think the worst of people. You have to be very, very cynical. And this is something you only can tell journalists about. We, we, this is something we just talk about inside uh, this room, because otherwise people outside would think we'd be very, very cynical. But you have to be cynical when you are an investigative journalist. You have to think, if I was corrupt, well, it's unthinkable, but try to think it. If I was corrupt, how could I profit from the system? And it doesn't matter which system you get into, you will always find people profit from the system. If the opportunity is there, you will always find it. So it's just up to you to identify the possibilities to misuse or profit from the system. I'll give you an example. Uh, people, um, uh, politicians, officials from all over Europe, every spring they go to Cannes on the French Riviera uh, to uh, this conference. Uh, it's a con conference, uh, what's it about? Uh, I almost forgot. But it's a conference for uh, local politicians and, and officials, um, and they stay one week. And if you know that your local politician or official uh, are there, what could be more natural than examining their expenses when they come home? Because they want their expenses covered by the community. And um, yesterday, Joachim Dievermark and uh, uh, Sven Bergman told you uh, about this corruption deal uh, uh, with Tilia Sonera and uh, Gunara Karimova. That was a deal uh, worth $300 million. And in fact, our viewers didn't get that upset. We didn't get that reaction from our viewers that we expected. But when we made this, this investigation on, on the bills coming from those officials and politicians from Cannes, then something else happened. Here's an example. A high official in Gothenburg bought uh, something from a woman clothing store worth 60 euro, and he uh, put in, made this an expense for lunch and you can see uh, the other persons eating lunch. But this is a, a bill, a receipt from a clothing store. But he tried to make it look like a lunch bill. He's, in fact, even given a tip, five euro tip. So this is 65 euro expense for the Gothenburg tax base. And this made people so upset that this guy had to resign from his job, and was a really big story in Sweden. This is quite bizarre, but that's the way it is in Sweden. We have something called kickoff meeting where we discuss the ideas. We give the reporters one, two, maybe three weeks to do a pre-reporting to sniff on the idea. Then we demand a kickoff meeting. Here we have the devil's advocate, asking all those nasty questions no reporter wants to hear. The mission for the devil's advocate is kill the story. Kill the story. How could we be wrong? We are wrong. That he, that's his assignment, to push, push the reporter as much as possible. Um, we also discuss the minimum and the maximum all the time. Do we have the minimum and what is the maximum? The minimum is good enough to publish. Something new and important and relevant to our viewers. We shall not repeat what is already known. We, we should tell our viewers something they need to know, something they want to know, and something they shouldn't have known if we hadn't published it. That's the minimum. And the maximum is what we hope to achieve, but cannot promise in any way. We have one dilemma here. 
and there, it's very common, almost all reporters have this problem, that everything is so important. And if you have difficulties to define, which I suppose you have, you have to find a solution to this dilemma. And we really try to work on this because we know that we are supposed to produce 45 programs a year. We cannot spend months after months after month after month to examine all those tracks. We have to choose the key track. What is the most important track? And here, hypothesis is a very helpful method. But that's, that means that you have to put your assumption, assumption, not conclusion, assumption in one or two sentences. What are you trying to prove? Put that in one sentence or two. And when it comes to this uh, 300 million bribe story, the hypothesis was this, and we could make this hypothesis quite early in the process. And it so, soon ended up in a conclusion, a thesis, that the Swedish tele tel telecom company paid 250 million in bribes to Gunnar Karimova, the daughter of the Uzbek president, in exchange for entry into the Uzbek market. Then 250 million became 300 million later on. And if you have problems with just one hypothesis, do two, do three, that make it, makes it easier to choose the most important one. Yes, this is the big challenge in every investigation, how to prove the wrongdoing. And we all know that we have to get evidence close, being close is not enough. 80%, 90%. You know how it is, but you cannot prove it. It's not enough. If we leave, leave just 1%, 5%, that means that we will be attacked by the target of the, the investigation. Lousy journalism, nothing new, fall on its own absurdity, insulting libel. We have to prove it to 100%. We should not insinuate a wrongdoing. We should prove it. But how? Um, the solution is we have to get the documents to verify everything. And in Sweden, we have a great Freedom of Information Act that next year will be 250 years old. But still, we have problems sometimes to get documents through this Freedom of Information Act. So we have to work in the same way as Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein did. Um, I met an African investigative reporter two weeks ago. I will not mention which country because he's the only investigative reporter in that country. But he said to me, my colleagues believe that I'm bribing the officials because I get the documents all the time. But I tell them, I'm not bribing anyone. I just cultivate them. I talk to the officials and I make them help me get those classified documents. I have no problems getting those documents. My colleagues cannot, cannot believe it, and I can't understand. How do I do? And um, I think that's really worth to talk about here, how to get those sources, those officials. Because these are the documents we need. Confidential. When you got, get a document like that in your hand, you get very happy. Confidential. Yes. How to get them. We are working old school in many ways. We try to get out on the field as soon as possible. Not to stay in the newsroom, but get out on the field, meet people. Um, sometimes we make it, try to make it hard to say no to us. And how do we make it hard to say no? 
for example, to knock on, on, a people's, on people's doors. That's what Woodward and Bernstein did in the Watergate story. They knocked on doors. And when you see a person standing at your doorstep, looking uh, quite nice, very polite, of course, it's very hard to say no. So yes, come in. Um, we avoid sometimes to call people or write email to get a first contact. We write a paper letter. Because nowadays, it's very unique to get a letter, a personal letter, on paper. And when you get a paper letter, you will, you will be very, very curious, in a very positive mood. What is this? A person has written a letter to me. You see a, a personal written address and so on. What can this be about? And you open this letter in, in, a, in a moment when you have time to read and so on. This is a very good start of a relationship. And uh, we often succeed in getting contact. For example, with sensitive, insensitive issues when it comes to victims. This is a very good way to start a relation. Or if it's a source you want to make a contact with, to write a letter on paper explaining what you want and what you're doing and who you are. And we try to visit the governments as much as we can to get contact and relations with the officials. And it's getting more and more uh, unique, uh, journalists visiting, visiting uh, governments, because journalists nowadays tend to stay in the newsroom and not get out on the field. And we try to cultivate sources everywhere. So how do you find your deep throat? You know, this is the garage of Washington where those guys, Woodward, Bernstein, had that deep throat source, the classic secret source of the Watergate scandal. I'll give you some tips. First of all, you have to try to identify people uh, with the information you need, people with expertise on this subject. And you should always assume that everybody wants to talk to you. Never think that he will never talk to me. She will never answer. She will get angry. So on. Never think in a negative way when it comes to contact people with information you need. And you should ask for a meeting. Not mention the word interview. That's a terrible word. Very, very dangerous word, interview, because then suddenly the person sees himself or herself on the very black he headlines. And maybe you should not say, I'm doing an investigation on corruption at your company. Maybe you should not say that. Maybe you should say that, I'm trying to get a fair picture of what's happened. That's more neutral. And that's also what your job is about. It's not lying saying that. And you have to, to, to get trust. You have to give trust. And a good way to give trust is to be as open as you can with, with what you are working on, with your hypothesis and your knowledge about this case. And, and this is a very tricky ethical question. But to get something, you sometimes have to give something. Do you think it's okay to collaborate with the police? To give the police something? to get something from the police. Is that ethical, okay? It's very easy to say no. Very, very easy to say no. But I avoid to say no. And I don't say yes, neither, because I'm the editor of this program, and uh, I would not stand here saying it's okay to collaborate with the police. But it might be, under some circumstances, justified to do that. I don't say that we do it, but I say it could be justified. <clears throat> okay, how to get people to talk to you even if I don't want to talk to you? Your challenge here is to get them to talk to you, but how to do it? I have some uh, suggestions here. This is really a good one. You don't want to talk to me, and you don't have to talk to me. I will talk to you. I will tell you about what I know about this. You don't have to say anything. Of course, uh, this, 
this is an offer, it's very hard to say no, because this person gets curious. What does this journalist know? And I don't have to say anything. Then you meet this person, and you tell the person as much as you can, and the person th thinks, oh, this is very interesting, <laughs> and I don't have to say anything. And then you say, thank you very much, you goodbye, and then you go home, and then to the newsroom, and a couple of days later, you write a letter, maybe an email this time, maybe a paper letter, saying, thank you for this meeting. It was very interesting to meet you, and I hope I can come back to you, because I, may, I might have something more to tell you. And then you meet this person a second time, telling this person what you know. And now something happens. The person thinks, ah, this, 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 this journalist is really crazy, but he's re really, really serious. I have to give him something back. Because he gives me so much, now I have to give something back. That's a um, really good way to get people to talk. Uh, when it comes to the Watergate story, you know, this deep truth, he didn't say so much. He was just confirming uh, facts, if they were true or not true. He didn't give them information, he was confirming information. And that's also a good method. You don't have to say something yourself, but can you confirm that this is true? Uh, this is a more neutral question. I, I don't, you don't have to talk, but I have some documents. Please, can you help me to understand them? Uh, flattering always works. I've talked to many people, and everybody says that you are so competent. I should talk to you. <coughs> so I've learned something during the years. That's true. That's a good start. Um, I know you don't want to talk to me, but I need some help with the fact-checking. And it's in everybody's interest that we publish is correct. And this is like a win-win situation. And to help with quality control, that's a very positive thing. And this is also something that you can use to get a closer relation to a source. This is a little bit more nasty, but it works. I don't know, I know you don't want to talk, but... Um, you don't want to talk with me, but I found some documents that affects you. Oh, what? What? Yeah, we can, let's have a meeting and I, I'll show you. This is something that um, is hard to say no to. And to win the source, you have to show that you're trustworthy, that you're worth uh, the risk, because you have to... Uh, Admit, we have to admit that people that are helping us, they are taking a risk. They can lose their job, they can be threatened, uh, very much even worse things can happen. And um, how can we convince them to collaborate with us? And how can we show that we are worth this trust? Um, I think we should be very open with the risks. We, we should tell the source about the law, what is the law saying about this, about being in a whistleblower, and how can we protect the source. We have had um, at this conference, um, uh, in this program, we have great, uh, we learned about great tools, red phone, we have read uh, Signal, uh, Text Secure, PGP, and so on. That's something we can discuss. Maybe we should give the, the source a prepaid cell phone, a prepaid cell phone, and have com com communicate that way. And we have to discuss how facts can be used. We have to be very open with the source about everything. And where should we meet? Also an, an important question. And sometimes we give the source final cut, which means that the source will read the manuscript before publication. And if the source feels it's something here that is too sensitive or that can lead to the source, we will exclude that from the manuscript. This is just some examples of how you can build trust with a source. When working like this, I, I believe you can get inside any operation, any company, any government, everywhere. Because there are always people who thinks that what we are doing is very important. People 
who are upset with the conditions where they are working. They are willing to help us. It's up to us to identify them and to show them that we are worth the trust. Yes, um, I see it too often, reporters gathering information. And nowadays we print out so many documents. Uh, and uh, I see it also in the laptops, of course, but I think most reporters, investment reporters, like to have uh, documents on paper. Anyhow, I don't see the reporters reading all those documents they are printing out or that are collecting on, on their computer. They don't read it because they don't have time to read it all, because they have to find any more, even more documents. They don't take time to sit down and analyze and read and analyze and read and analyze the material, which means they might miss the crucial detail that explains everything. So you have to take time, sit down one day, two days, and read it all. Uh, there are some tools for investigative reporters to structure what you have found, the, the timeline is the classical tool, the chronology. I show you another tool here. It's about to extract what you need from a huge uh, and very complicated material. It's four steps. You read everything in detail, then you break it down after your needs, what you need. Uh, you, made, uh, you sort the material uh, in a way that uh, can give you the information you need, and then you analyze the new picture. Um, I give you a um, hypothetical uh, example here. Let us say we have a case of wrongly convicted, and the prosecutor say the testimony is not us, is consistent. The spelling is not the best, is consistent according to the prosecutor. And then you extract the information in uh, this way, because if you have a an, uh, police investigation with 1,000 pages, 1,000 pages, and you just read and read and read, it can be hard to see the pattern. But if you extract the facts that is relevant for your investigation, then suddenly you have a pattern very, very clear and this, we talk about a knife uh, stab. A man was killed through a, by a knife stab. And witness A say it was Mr. Black on page 114. And then page 203, it was Mr. Green, and so on. We find that the witnesses were not consistent. So this is a way to extract information from a big, big material. And the conclusion is, the prosecutor is wrong. This is a very important step to demand accountability. The, the, it's a key thing in investigative reporting. And that's something that we make a lot of efforts in our newsroom when it comes to get the other side of the story. And you know, you don't know if you have a story until you've heard the other side. So we try to make a contact as early as possible to make sure we have a story. Because the objections from the other side can mean there are explanations we don't know about. And maybe that leads to, we are saying, we cannot do this story. And making a relation, a dialogue with, with, this, with the target, the subject of the investigation. It's very, very important, if you can do it. Because it also means you get fact-checking by the real expert, the expert on the wrongdoing. But also it means that you will not get late explanations that you will not have time to examine. If you get those explanations early on, then you can examine those explanations, and maybe you find that the person is lying, and you can prove that this person is lying. 
sometimes um, when the target refuses to command, we make an ambush into you. And it's very, very risky. Uh, we did one last week without any problems, because when you make an ambush into you, you have to be sure that the audience, the viewers, are just as upset as our reporter is. I'll give you an example here. This old man here, that's Ingvar Kamprad. He's the owner of IKEA. He is an icon in Sweden. We made an investigation on IKEA and on Kamprad uh, and uh, made the conclusion that Ingvar Kamprad is not telling it like it is. He has said to the public in many interviews that IKEA is controlled by a private foundation. No, sorry, is controlled by a non-profit foundation. Non-profit foundation in Holland. We could reveal that it's in fact controlled by a private foundation, foundation in, in uh, Liechtenstein. Controlled by himself. Okay. So we tried to get an interview with him by Kampra. At uh, th this time, he, I think he was 85 years old, still active, though. And uh, we didn't get an interview, and now let's see what's happened. Four months have passed since we met IKEA's founder in the car park at Elmhold and asked for an interview. We never got that interview. Ingvar Kamprad isn't so keen to talk about taxes or foundations in Liechtenstein. It's half past five, the day before Christmas Eve. The party in IKEA's stockroom in Elmholt is over. Ingvar Kamprad has preferred his Christmas greetings to IKEA staff and to specially invited journalists. Ingvar Kamprad, Magnus Svensson, Sveriges Television, for granskning. Yeah. 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 Stiftelsen Och så hittar vi pengar, hundra miljarder i Liechtenstein. Vi har lovat att vi ska svara på alla frågor. Han är ju sjuk i huvudet den här mannen. Vi är sjuk i huvudet. Jag tror att det var rätt att göra den här ambush. Men de viewers inte gillade det inte. Vi hade nästan 2 miljoner viewers. 85 procent hade oss efter programmet. Vi har även fått död threats because of this. So you have to look out, uh, look up and um, be sure that you have the views on your side if you're doing an ambush. But sometimes I think it's motivated. And um, now I just give you two examples how to do, to prove wrongdoing. You hide what you know or you pretend you know. Um, to hide what you know can be, can be very effective. You have evidence, but you don't show the evidence immediately. And you do that to destroy the credibility of the target. Uh, this is from a corruption story from uh, the Gothenburg, where we live and operate. Uh, and uh, we have a lot of tradition in Gothenburg when it comes to corruption in the community. And um, we got um, a tip from a wife of an official, she was divorced. She told us that her husband, uh, who is uh, working at the department of the uh, Gothenburg uh, city, and he is totally corrupt. My former husband is totally corrupt, she said. Okay, interesting. And then she showed us this picture of her husband in shades, and the other officials, uh, having a nice time in on the French Riviera at the Chateau 
of a supplier to the city of Gothenburg, uh, an owner of a con construction company, who gets a lot, a lot of uh, orders from the city of Gothenburg and makes millions out of that. The officials were in, in, on the French Riviera, invited by this uh, supplier. And of course, uh, he paid for everything. But what to do with this picture? She told us about many things, but this is something concrete. It's a document, it's a picture. Now we can confront the official with the picture and ask him, how do you explain that you and your colleagues from the city of Gothenburg are here on vacation with this supplier? That's a natural thing to do. But we decided not to. We decided to see if he will lie for us, if we will hold this information. And if we lie, then we know we have a story. And if we have good explanations, then we drop the story. Here's the wife, very angry. <laughs> she was in the story. And here's the man. Har du varit på hans sådana ska vi franska vi göra? Vi hyrde dig en gång jag och min hustru. Ja. Men då hyrde jag det och det betalade jag. Precis allt ihop var dit och vi bilade ner. Du har inte varit där på uh, ihop med dina jobbarkompisar? Nej, eller? nej. Jag har inte varit. Utan det bara när det är bara jag och min hustru. Vi har varit där nere en eller två gånger. Ska vi titta på den här kort då? Ska vi ta den? Mm. Okay, we knew we had a story. And that was hidden camera, also something you have to be respected with using. Then you can pretend that you know and that you have evidence. Uh, sometimes it's so frustrating, you know something, but you cannot prove it. It might take months, maybe take years, maybe it's impossible to get the evidence you need. Then you can try this method of pretending that you have the evidence which you cannot get hold of. Uh, this is an example. Uh, this is our reporter, Sofia Jabridis. She's confronting uh, the major of a small uh, community, uh, Österåker. And Sofia has she knows that this mayor has um, got, um, what's her name now, uh, money from uh, a very rich and very important uh, family in this community. And in fact, all the political polit politicals decisions are in favor of this rich and powerful family. And how come that the politicians always decide in the interest of this rich uh, family? Sophia gets the information that this mayor has got money, a loan from this family, and this mayor is starting a new private school in Österåke, and it's financed partly by this uh, rich uh, family. And but she has no evidence. And here you see you know, uh, uh, the binder. You see the binder here? What does this binder signal? It signals that this journalist has a lot of evidence. And it makes uh, the target even more nervous and uncomfortable. Sophia always has this binder when she's doing this confrontational interview. <laughs> And that's a very good tip. And okay, let's see what happens here. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, um, this is the principle of credibility. The dilemma now for this woman who, who is the major of Estok is that if she had to, to decide, shall I tell the truth and lose reputation? Or shall I tell a lie and risk to lose even more reputation? That's the dilemma. 
we can call it the principle of credibility. How, should, how shall she uh, 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 handle this dilemma? Let's see what's happened. Det är bara banklån och intäckning på ert eget hus alltså. Vi har ett lån från en privatperson också. Mm. Vem var det? jag vet inte om den personen vill att vi uppger det här för det är en relation mellan oss. Mm. jag har ju information om att den personen är grevefamiljen. Stämmer det? Det finns en person i den familjen som har lånat oss pengar, ja. Okay. We got the confirmation and that led to an investigation, police investigation for corruption. Yes, I had a session here before, one hour talking about line by line. Now I have five minutes. I do a budget light version of line by line because it's very, very important to use time enough to make sure what you publish is correct, fair and balanced. And uh, if we spend so much time on doing research, we are interviewing, recording, editing, writing and so on, the least our public could expect is that you get spend so much amount of time to make sure that everything is correct, accurate and fair. Uh, and when it comes to line by line, the key is verification. Uh, and if you are, like most investigative reporters, if you are uh, docaholic, a docaholic, it's, it's a very serious disease, as we all know, but if you are a docaholic, it helps. Of course, if you love documents, you collect documents all the time, you just have to make sure that you have your documents in order in some way. Because everything you publish, everything in your manuscript has to be verified in the line-by-line -line process. Uh, we make this line-by-line -line one eight days before uh, broadcasting. We broadcast on Wednesdays, and then we do this line-by-line -line on Tuesday the week before. And then the editor has a very important role in doing this. And the editor has to make sure to, first of all, watch the story, of course, and make... Uh, a an impression, what is uh, the impression of a story? Is it trustworthy, is it balanced? Something that sticks out, something that we have to change, and so on. And then the editor has to, in detail, read the manuscript and uh, mark all facts, conclusions, criticism, and so on. Um, sometimes we use this matter, yellow for facts and uh, conclusions, and red for criticism. And when you're doing this process, you have to make sure that you can work with concentration. We do that, uh, we don't have to lock the door to the room, but it's good that if you put off your cell phones and really concentrate on this uh, process, which takes around between four hours and eight hours, depending how complicated the issue is or how prepared the reporters are. Everything, everything, everything should be verified even quotes from interview persons. If a person is lying, or if a person is wrong, it might be okay, but we should know if the person is wrong. We often discuss, as journalists always want to maximize everything, we always tend to maximize. So how, how many are some, several? Many. Is four many? No, probably not. How many are hundreds? If a reporter writes hundreds of people are affected, how many are hundreds? Once I asked a reporter, you write here uh, hundreds, can you, can you uh, be a little, little bit more precise? Yeah, it's 218. Do you mean 218? Is that hundreds? Hundreds for me are more like six, 700 or something like that. Well. We had a discussion about that, and then we changed to over 200. And watch out for overstatements like this. Everybody says, or this is very common, they haven't done anything to help the victim. The government haven't done anything. If you write a conclusion like that, 
That means the burden of proof is on you as a reporter. That, of course, they have done something, at least maybe put a pen from here to there, something like that. He was talking to her 24 hours a day. Is that possible? Well, the reporter says, that's what we say. We say 24 hours a day. Yes, but for us, we, die, we have to have precision in journalism. Almost 24 hours a day. Um, an investigation without a conclusion is often an investigation without an edge. If you want to make impact with your story, you have to tell what this means. All the research you have done has to end up in a conclusion. You're not quoting or referring A says that and B says that. It's you who are making a conclusion, to draw a conclusion upon your material you have collected and analyzed. And that is taking a risk, but that is a risk you have to take as an investigative uh, reporter. And this is the moment where we discuss the conclusions. Are they well-founded? Or maybe we can sharpen the conclusion. Or maybe we have to soften the conclusion. Can we say that Ingvar Kamprad is lying? Or shall we say that he is not telling it like it is when it comes to this foundation? I think we could have said that he's lying because he said in many interviews officially that IKEA is controlled by non-profit organization, uh, foundation in Holland. But we didn't say that. And I'm glad we didn't say that. We said he's not telling it like it is. I mean, I'm just thinking of you know, the reaction of this program, so I'm glad we didn't say he's lying. But then I, know, I don't know what had happened with that. Uh, the criticism to make sure that all allegations are answered to is so important. Um, and sometimes we find that the reporters has answered to criticism A, B, and D, but not C. Why not C? Then the reporters say, ah, that, that's not much of criticism. All right, maybe a little, little bit critical, but not much. But we know that this, this will be used against us. This will blown out of proportions of the subject of the, of the investigation. So we have to make sure that all critical points, all allegations, will be answered to. And we have a three-step uh, model when it comes to make sure that we get comments, answers to allegations. Uh, and the first contact is make an interview, we get no. The second step is that we inform about uh, criticism, uh, and the subject says no. And then the third step is that we inform on exact phrases in the manuscript. And at that moment, we often get reactions. And this is maybe just a week before uh, publications. So we give them three chances to answer two allegations. How to, line by line, facts that are not included but should have been included in the story. That's a tricky one. Some questions that should be asked. And the first is very easy for the reporter. Are any relevant information missing? Is any information missing? Relevant information? Of course not, the reporter says. Of course not. This is more tricky. If we include the facts in the story that we had decided not to include, would that change the picture, the whole picture? Or if our viewers knew that we, had, we have decided to leave these facts out of the story, will they get disappointed with us? That's an interesting question. And if you would be confronted by a media investigative reporter, who terrible, media investigative reporter, and be confronted with the question, how could you defend your selection? Would you have problems with defending your selection of facts? That's a good question, too. And also to discuss, even if we find the selection motivated, can we defend 
how do we defend the selection? And the last question at this line by line, how does it feel now? How do you feel in the stomach? Something that is worrying you. Now is the last chance to talk about it. Um, you don't, maybe you don't have the, all the time we have to do this uh, line by line uh, fact checking, but in any newsroom, you always have some minutes. If you're working on a news story, you always have at least a couple of minutes, five minutes, 15, 30 minutes. I think you have to do what you can to make sure what you publish is correct when it comes to a story where you where mention people or companies or governments in a, a negative way. Facts, verify everything, conclusions, examine the grounds, allegations, check the response. Do what you can to make sure that your reporting is accurate and fair. And here is my contact details, and if you want my, our manuals, you can find it here on our website. Thank you, Nils. Thank you. I know that everyone is uh, desperate for lunch, but we do have time for one or two questions. And if you have further questions, you can always contact Nils, uh, of course. But is there anyone that is... Okay, I'll bring the mic. If you want my uh, presentation here, you can write me uh, an email, because I don't have the rights to all those pictures here. Uh, so I have to withdraw them from the presentation. Hi, I'm uh, Ava Schramm from the Netherlands, uh, and I was wondering about contacting sources. I have a source who I've talked about a couple uh, with a couple of times, but now he says more like this. Oh yeah, now he says um, I signed a declaration of uh, secrecy a couple of years ago, and now I feel bound by that. So how would you convince a source like that to keep talking to you? Yeah, I've had that problem uh, with uh, sources having signed an uh, agreement like that and that it means a risk for them to talk to us and to give us information. Uh, it's very uh, hard to say how to do uh, because it it's can be very, very risky. Uh, we, uh, in one case, we got some information despite this contract, but we used it in a way that we both she and we felt 100% sure that that wouldn't affect her uh, position in any way. Uh, but that's a common problem. It gets, it gets more and more common that people have to sign uh, secrecy agreements with their employee, and that means, of course, it's difficult for them to talk to journalists because they're taking a huge risk. But uh, many of our sources are taking risks, and that's why we have to be very, very careful in our relation with, with, with the sources and how we use the information. And also, that's why we need these uh, tools that this uh, uh, conference is telling about to be, make sure that what our contact with the source is traceable, not, should not be traceable in any way. Okay, a very short last question here. Please introduce yourself. My name is Ordinary Ahmad Isa from Nigeria. I, in the course of um, that short clip, rather than carry that heavy um, folder, that file, along with you to give an impression that you have um, facts stored there, me being a broadcast journalist, that I will not want to use documents as such, will it be okay if I give an impression like um, after dropping the first question and the person is like trying to answer and you, you give that the person, the respondent, uh, an impression that um, you are just about to say, I, I was told that uh, you, uh, you, you, and then you, you know, keep it there, more like pushing the person to get under the impression that you have a lot to, to tell, but you're just holding back to listen to the person. Is it safe or unethical? I don't think it's unethical, and I thank you for the tip. Uh, because I think that that's... Uh, uh, and, uh, you take one more step. 
you opening uh, all these documents and pretending even more that you have this evidence here, I think it's okay. <laughs> thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you.